Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is February the 10th, 2021. Let's talk Deontay Wilder. But remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, the Deontay Wilder story really is an unfortunate one. Right, let's just keep it 100 here. He was getting badly beaten, badly beaten by Tyson Fury. Hadn't hurt Fury, hadn't come close to hurting Fury, had already hit the canvas, was being battered, couldn't protect himself, was getting bullied over to the side of the ring, right? Was bleeding out of his ear, looked dead. Right? Later would claim that his 40-pound uniform walking in the ring weakened his legs. Well, his trainer, Mark Breland, and understand, if you were alive in the 1980s, there's a moment there where Mark Breland in the 1980s, the middle of the decade, was one of the best-known boxers in America. Right, he was the crown jewel of the amateur boxing team in the United States. So this is a guy who himself was a champion, who himself has climbed the mountain in boxing. And understand, very few have. Right, for every champion, there are literally hundreds of fighters who don't make it. Right, for every gold medalist, there are many guys who showed up at the Olympics and did not leave with medals. So as I see it, Deontay Wilder was fortunate to have Mark Breland in his corner. Right now, maybe this is the bias in me. Mark Breland's a New Yorker. I was raised in Queens, New York. Well, let's just say that things started getting disturbing after Mark Breland pulled the plug on the fight. Now, let's be clear here. This was a heavyweight title fight, right? Heavyweight fight, not a lightweight fight, heavyweight fight. The guys punch harder. People get hurt. You have a lot of great heavyweight champs who ended up, in my opinion, and I'm just talking about my opinion, with slurred speech in the case of Joe Fraser, right, with Parkinson's. I know people are going to say, oh, there's no proof that it was caused by boxing. I don't know how getting hit in the head could help, right? Ali had Parkinson's. I would argue that it's boxing related. Keep in mind, too, Ezra Charles ended up with Alzheimer's, and I'm naming elite fighters. All of the guys I've just named were heavyweight champions. Just figure out the risk involved. If your fighter's in there and he's already been down, he's fighting an unbeaten fighter who's knocked out some guys brutally. Look at the stoppage in the Tyson Fury-Steve Cunningham fight. Right? Well, let's just say I thought Mark Breland made the right call, quite frankly, by stopping that fight. Wilder got to live for another day. As it was, there was blood coming out of Wilder's ear. Wilder did not look alert in the ring. You didn't get the feeling he was going to come back in the fight. So, of course, Wilder upset. First loss as a professional. Understand he was heavyweight champ for five years. I know many of you disagree with me, but I believe Wilder is a Hall of Famer. Right, he's put in the work. Five years is a long reign. Right, it's a long reign. Well, Wilder then started making crazy accusations. Some of them defamatory, in my opinion. Right, it's one thing to say, hey, I disagreed with my trainer's decision to stop the fight. Okay, that's fair enough. Right, a fighter says, hey, I thought I was okay. I thought I could have continued. All right. I don't consider that defamation. 
But then accusing the trainer of being disloyal, that's getting close to the line. When you make the claim, as some reports have stated, that Wilder claims that his trainer spiked his water. Think about that. Spiked his water. Drugged him during the fight to cause him to lose. I believe that's defamatory, unless you can show that it happened. Right? Quite frankly, I thought the reason Wilder looked disoriented was he was fighting a great heavyweight. Right? You get hit by a few of these Tyson Fury punches, you might not be lucid. Well, okay, so things ended badly for the Wilder-Mark Breland relationship, right? Wilder believes that Breland was disloyal. Wilder believes that Breland may have drugged him during the fight, right? Sounds preposterous. By the way, there are cameras all over. This was a heavyweight, this was a heavyweight unification match. There are cameras all over the place. I have yet to see any film clip that resembles Panama Lewis in the corner of Aaron Pryor during his fight against Alexis Arguello, right? Where speculation has run amok about that fight, right? Lewis says, not that bottle. Give me the one I mixed, right? They had multiple water bottles in the corner. Think about that. Well, here there's nothing like that. So I'm not sure what Wilder's getting at when he claims he was drugged. Also, the excuses are contradictory. Which one is it? Was it the 40-pound uniform that you wore into the ring that weakened you? Or were you drugged after you got in the ring? Maybe what Wilder needs to start doing is thinking about his decision, and he had to sign off on it, to wear a 40-pound outfit into the ring, right? Maybe that has a lot to do with Wiley Lost, right? That and, of course, Tyson Fury's right hand, straight right hand from distance. Well, today, and it's February the 10th, 2021, you have an interview, and it's very well done, on BoxingScene.com, of Mark Breland. And Breland says things that I believe are widespread in boxing. Right? I don't believe we get the full picture of what's going on watching TV. I don't think we understand how much some of these professional athletes are in a bubble. Let me just say too, Wilder's an interesting case study because Wilder has a spectacular right hand, right? Tremendous KO power. Some of his knockouts are just breathtaking. The Brazil knockout, first round, I thought that was breathtaking. He has great power. Very high KO percentage. But as you watch him, and Teddy Atlas has done a great job here on YouTube. Let me give a plug to Teddy uh, in his videos, talking about Wilder's fight style. As you watch him, you don't notice him materially improving. It's not like you see this fight and then you think, okay, well, he's working on certain things. For example, Anthony Joshua. I notice Anthony Joshua, in time, big gifted puncher, in time has worked on a jab. Right? That jab's very important. It's helped him in fights. The Joseph Parker fight, for example. You also notice, too, that Anthony Joshua has worked on his back foot. So if you look at old Joshua films, you notice Joshua has improved in some areas, right, over the years. Also, his stamina. Right now, we could fault Joshua. Certainly, I fault Joshua for not finishing off Kubrat Pulev, you know, backing away a bit too much, having a guy get off the canvas and then somehow get back in the fight. Right? But the bottom line is, you notice Joshua is mindful of stamina. 
right? Young Joshua would go all out, then be dead in the middle of a fight against Vladimir Klitschko, right? Older Joshua is pacing himself. Well, you don't notice that development with Deontay Wilder, and Wilder is in his 30s. Understand, Wilder again, heavyweight champ for five years. You would think somewhere along his reign, he would say, you know what? I'm losing every round here to Luis Ortiz in this rematch. In other words, the more my opponent has seen of me, the better he's getting. Maybe I need to do some new things. Figure out a way to keep this guy off balance. Win some rounds. Right? In actuality, not just on the judges' scorecards. I don't know what the judges are doing in Wilder fights. But win some rounds. So the fight doesn't come down to can I KO Tyson Fury in the 12th round? Right? The fight doesn't come down to me needing a knockdown with a nine count in the 12th round to get a draw against a guy in his third fight back from being out of the ring multiple years. Right? That's the first Fury fight. Well, you notice that Wilder really just wasn't improving that much. And it's the problem a lot of athletes have in sports. I'm a baseball fan, <clears throat> and I've noticed some guys enter the major leagues with great fastballs. They can throw it by almost anybody. But then you notice, in time, after the wear and tear of several seasons, the fastball pitcher slows down a little bit. And then you notice he has no other tricks in his bag. Right? You uh, notice that the guy doesn't even have a better idea than to throw a fastball to Hank Aaron or Barry Bonds or A-Rod or Mike Trout. Well, I've called Deontay Wilder a fastball pitcher in the past for the lack of development. Well, Mark Breland comments on it. In the article today, February the 10th, 2021, that's on BoxingScene.com. Let me read a portion of the interview. Let me also point out, too, that Mark Breland is a former world champion. He also was the 1984 Olympic gold medalist. Right, So we're talking about a guy with an excellent boxing pedigree. He's been at the top both as an amateur and and as a professional. And if you're of a certain age, you remember Breland's reputation. So let me just read a few paragraphs, three paragraphs from the article today. My time in the coach position with the Bronze Bomber changed drastically in the 12 years since I started with him. So, JD's was seen as the head trainer, but I was the only one on the team with a boxing resume. <laughs> and I was the only trainer. This was okay with me because of my humility. After Deontay became a name in boxing, new members joined the team. And it got to the point where I didn't even have my fighter's phone number. I haven't spoken to Deontay alone in years. The things that I told Deontay to do had to be run past Jay. Deontay became untrainable because he was at the point of he knows more about boxing than all of us. So teaching a correct jab was not a priority to learn once he continued on his knockout streak. So a coach can only teach someone if they're willing to learn. Right, folks, I'm just telling you, this is widespread in sports. The athlete has gotten to the top, and he believes he's done so, doing it, to quote Frank Sinatra, his way. Right, some of these guys don't want to listen to other people. The fastball, right, that straight right hand from distance is working. Guys are falling down. The champion's unbeaten. He's winning fights. 
Now to me, what separates this personality type from the greats is that you look at a great. Let's look at LeBron James for a moment. And you'll ask yourself, well, how could this guy at 6, 7, early on, 6, 9 now, how could this guy decide that he's going to learn to pass the basketball the way he does? Understand, you have to figure the guy was one of the tallest guys in high school. You knew the guy was good enough to get drafted into the NBA straight out of high school. But yet, for some reason, the guy decided, hey, you know what? I don't want to be pigeonholed as a big man. I don't want to just learn to rebound and work back to the basket. I want to learn guard skills. So, of course, last year, look it up in the NBA. The guy who led the NBA in assists per game was 6'9", LeBron James. Right? You look at Canelo. And he's down fighting at like 147 and stuff like that. And you say, hey, you know, I wonder if this guy's going to have a good career at 147. It's not enough. He's at 154. It's not enough. He's at 160. It's not enough. He's at 168. It's not enough. He goes to 175. Think about that. Now he's back down at 168. And as you look at Canelo, you notice the guy is adding to his game. I don't remember all this head movement when Canelo was a younger guy. Right now he's in with guys who, when he was 147, you thought were way too big for him. Callum Smith. And he's walking them down. Right, think about Mickey Mantle for a second. Great player, more than 500 home runs. What is it that caused Mickey Mantle to decide to learn to switch hit? If you're as good a hitter from one side of the plate as Mickey Mantle was, why would it cross your mind to bat from the other side of the plate? Right, Mantle, by the way, Leads the major leagues in home runs, RBIs, and average the year he wins a triple-double with numbers good enough to have done so in either league. Right, think about it. You know, Hank Aaron was the premier RBI guy in major league history. He's number one, folks. You don't even think about it because Hank Aaron's number one in home runs. Right, Willie Mays, my God. Think about it. You're the base runner. Willie Mays was. Willie Mays leads the league multiple times in steals. But yet, Willie Mays is also the gold standard in the field. And by the way, Willie hit something like 660 home runs. Right, the greats are pushing themselves. They're their own worst critics. Right, LeBron James, right now, after leading the league in assists, after four MVPs, is now hitting 39% of his threes. Right, Steph Curry, tremendous shooter, tremendous shooter, once led the league in steals. Those are the guys at the top. Right, these are the guys who have a fastball, and then say, you know what? I need a curve. I need a changeup. These are the guys talking to other pitchers, saying, you know, when your fastball can't be located, what do you do in the later innings when you're a little tired? How do I learn your circle change? Right? What Mark Breland's telling you is that Deontay Wilder was at the top of the sport. Folks, there's the heavyweight champion, then there's everyone else. Here was a guy who was heavyweight champion, Olympic medalist, heavyweight champion for years. 
And you mean to tell me that he and his trainer didn't even have a one-on-one -on -one telephone conversation? You mean to tell me that his trainer, who would know, who's in the building, who's talking to the fighter, thought that his fighter was untrainable? Right, folks? This belongs in a movie. Okay, and it's stunning. Because after, of course, catastrophe hits. Right? Deontay loses his title. The person he should be embracing, the person in the room, willing to tell him, hey, champ, we need to improve in some areas. That's the person who's under fire from Deontay Wilder. Right, so if you're into the story of sports, the personalities involved, what motivates an athlete, whether an athlete is in a bubble or whether an athlete is the kind of guy who is just self-driven and needs to get to perfection, this Deontay Wilder story is just front and center. Right? It's just front and center. You know, there's a story going around. I believe the uh, guy telling the story is Levante David. Now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just won the NFC Championship game. This is the game before the Super Bowl. So they're going to their first Super Bowl. And it was a big moment for a lot of the guys. So one Tampa Bay Buccaneer <laughs> is crying. The guy is crying tears of joy. And Tom Brady comes by. Tom Brady says to the guy, what the hell are you doing? He says, look, we're not done yet. And Levante David happened to be next to the guy Tom Brady was yelling at. And David had tears in his eyes. And he said he had to wipe the tears away because he did not want Tom Brady to see him crying, right? This is Tom Brady after six Super Bowl wins, right? He's still hungry. He wants more. He wants to be the best. He's demanding the best of himself and the people around him. This Mark Breland piece on BoxingScene.com is kind of letting you know that that's not Deontay Wilder. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.